for the nice invitation and for allowing me to share some of my work uh, with you today. Uh, so it's going to be about uh, glassy dynamics in dense aggregate matter from cells uh, to particles. And so my background is a bit more on, on glassy physics and uh, theoretical physics. So let me first briefly introduce what we mean by glassy dynamics and the glass transition. And so the glass transition is typically um, the transition from, from a liquid state. So if you're at, at, at high enough temperatures or low enough densities. So for instance, we take a colloidal liquid and then uh, everything can still move throughout the material and we have a, a liquid state. But then as we start to cool down such a material or increase its density uh, and we prevent crystallization, which is usually done by introducing polydispersity in these kinds of systems, uh, it enters what is known as a supercooled regime where the dynamics starts to slow down dramatically. And then at some point when the density is increased so much or if the temperature is, is lowered so much, then it reaches a glass state where everything essentially is, is frozen in, but there's no apparent global structure. So it's still disordered, but it reaches a solid state. And so this is typically what we mean when we say uh, the glass transition and what a glassy state is. And with glassy dynamics, we typically mean the dynamics inside this, this supercooled regime where things become dramatically slow, but not yet fully uh, frozen in as it is for a glass. And so, of course, there's many examples of, of glassy materials and maybe the most uh, uh famous one is of course silica but also polymeric liquids or colloidal liquids but also metallic glasses granular particles and recently even living cells so this is going to be the main focus point for this talk um but i'll get back to that in a, in a couple of slides first i want to uh, illustrate what why from a physics perspective looking at the glass transition is is very interesting still and so we can ask ourselves then what happens when we approach the glass transition. And typically what happens on, on a structural level is, well, actually not that much. So in this case, we can look at, for instance, the radial distribution function, which is a measure for the probability of finding one particle and another particle a distance R away. And so for instance, for, for a simple colloidal liquid, as you approach the glass transition, so you do undergo supercooling, this will only change very mildly. And it's difficult to, to really tell the difference. Um, and especially if you only have one of these, these structure factors or these radial distribution functions, then it's difficult to tell whether you're in a liquid, supercooled, or even a glass machine, because we see only subtle structural changes, but these are accompanied by very dramatic changes in the dynamics. So in this case, you can also look at um, the mean square displacement, for instance, which is simply a measure of how dynamic your particles in a material are. And we can see that it changes by orders of magnitude, whereas this is only a very small change. And so this apparent disconnect between structure and dynamics is really what, what fascinates uh, researchers to look into to the glass transition problem and into the glassy physics. And so there's many uh, ideas of why this goes on, but one popular interpretation is uh, what is known as the cage effect. So typically in, in a liquid state, particles, even though they can experience dense conditions, they still have the ability to push other particles to the side and actually move throughout the material, which leads to a liquid state. But then if you slightly increase the density, for instance, you can reach the glass state in which this caging of surrounding particles becomes actually very dominant, even though there's only little structural changes and this caging leads to particles not being able to escape their local cage anymore because they have to push other particles to the side, which have to put, push other particles to the side and so on. And so this is really uh, a conceptual idea of, of what people think is going on during a glass transition. But of course, there's many more, more intricate features of, of glassy dynamics that I won't uh, go into too much detail about today because today I actually want to, to connect more to the, to the overall theme of, of this seminar series, which is actually uh, biology and biological physics. And so uh, I want to focus on actually this new class of glassy materials uh, in living matter. And so this is very uh, recent that people have interpreted or started recognizing glassy dynamics in living systems. So to, to illustrate this effect, 
Um, for instance, in, in this movie where upon increasing the density of cells, we can really see their dynamics slowing down and reaching from maybe a liquid or what could be interpreted as from a liquid to a more supercooled liquid state. Uh, something similar is going on, for instance, in, in tumor, where we can see cells being able to move throughout the tumor, but they do so relatively slowly. So it can also be, for instance, interpreted as, as a supercooled liquid state. But in other cases, uh, the cells remain fixed in place. But of course, that's not really a overall crystalline order. So it can really be interpreted as a glass state. But of course, these are only movies. Uh, this behavior has actually been quantified in a bit more detail uh, also in, in, for instance, a cell layer where they found uh, local velocity correlations, but also this, this dramatic slowdown of the dynamics when they looked at the inverse of the diffusion coefficient of cells, which also changes uh, with more than an order of magnitude. And this has even prompted researchers also to, to come up with a phase diagram of uh, transitioning between a liquid to a more glass-like state. But in this case, it depends on, on parameters like adhesion or cell motility. And so it's quite well established now that um, that the um, that glassy dynamics is is apparent in in these cellular systems, but not only do they see glassy dynamics, it's actually also being associated with with uh, diseases and development. So, for instance, in um, in asthmatic patients, they've shown that in 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 healthy tissue, cells remain roughly fixed in one place, so it's more a glass-like state. Whereas for asthmatic patients, the, the cells become highly dynamic. And this leads to, to a more fluid-like state. And similar things can be observed within a tumor where you have dynamic areas where, where cells can move throughout, so it's more liquid-like, but also caged uh, areas where particles remain, or in this case, cells remain fixed in place. And recently, it has even been argued that, that uh, this, this glassy behavior can even be essential in, in for instance, uh, tissue development. So, there's this glassy behavior in cells is not only apparent, but it's also carries some important biological function. But still coming from, from a physics background, uh, we are interested in asking ourselves the question, uh, can we maybe understand such a cell collective simply as a simple glassy fluid? So to what extent can we compare a cell layer, for instance, as simply a glassy liquid and then can we use our tools that we know from, from, uh, from glass physics to better understand the behavior of these cells? But this requires at least one very important ingredient that we are neglecting when we would compare this to conventional passive glass, glassy material, uh, and that's that cells are active particles. So cells can move by themselves. They can move intrinsically by converting energy in autonomous motion. So in a sense, they are active particles. So if we want to make a comparison between these, these cellular systems and simple uh, glassy models, then we should at least interpret it as an active glassy fluid. But then this also brings a problem because a lot of people, a lot of a lot is known about conventional glassy liquids and uh, glass theories, but very little is still known about active glassy dynamics and how activity influences glassy dynamics. And so this has actually been the main topic of, of my PhD thesis, which was simply asking ourselves from a minimal model perspective, uh, how does activity influence glassy dynamics? And so I would like to spend this, this second part of the talk uh, discussing some recent results we had um, trying to figure out uh, how activity influences glassy dynamics in the first place. Uh, but before I continue uh, uh, with, these, with these results and our recent results, I briefly also want to mention that the motivation for active glassy materials initially came from cellular systems, but recently they found that there's more experimental realizations of active glassy materials, both in the colloidal regime with Janus particles and the granular regime but also in other areas of biology where they found a glass transition for a dense collection of bacteria and also active glassy dynamics in chloroplasts in plant cells. So there's more and more experimental realizations, which has further motivated us to really look into the effect of, of activity on 
on glassy dynamics. And so we want to under, better understand this. And uh, initially we maybe asked ourselves arguably one of the simplest questions we could ask, which was simply, how does the long time dynamics of these particles in a glassy system at high densities change upon introducing more activity or introducing this active ingredient? And the reason we started off with maybe one of uh, a fairly simple question is because when we, when we looked into the literature already, this question gave conflicting results. So in a, several previous studies where they did simulations of an active glassy liquid, um, they've looked at the long time diffusion coefficient, which is simply a measure for, for how liquid or glass-like uh, your fluid is. So a larger value is a more liquid state, a smaller value is a more glassy state. And so when they introduced activity into the system, they found that in some cases they got a non-monotonic response, in other cases a decrease of the dynamics, and in other cases an increase of the dynamics. But what, what was especially surprising is that in all these cases, they've used the same active matter model and interaction potential, but they find different departures from equilibrium. So either the response or the, the influence of activity on glassy dynamics is, uh, is not easily grasped, or there's something still missing in these results and they can actually be reconciled with each other. So in order to tackle this problem, uh, we also did simulations of an active glassy liquid. And for that, we looked into um, what is known as the active Brownian particle model. So we look at a model active fluid, which is um, simply a dense collection of spherical particles that have some repulsive interaction to prevent overlap of the particles. And then we let each particle undergo Brownian motion, which is governed by a temperature T. But on top of that, we also introduce an active velocity, which captures this, this active motion effect, which is governed by an active velocity V and whose orientation randomly changes over time with a rotational diffusion coefficient dr, which is related to what is known as the persistence time via its inverse. And so the main advantage of, of choosing this model system actually is that we know that for individual particles, so when there's no interaction, uh, you can analytically calculate the mean square displacement, and it can be shown that when the time becomes larger than this persistence time, these particles actually become diffusive again. So what this means is that when you go beyond the persistence time, you actually retrieve a Brownian particle only at an effective temperature. And so this allows us very nicely to quantify the departure from equilibrium. So to capture this activity effect by simply increasing the persistence, and that way make, we make the particles more active, but at the same time fixing the effective temperature such that if we go to zero persistence, we essentially retrieve a passive system for which we know uh, more because it's a passive glassy liquid. And so what we then did is also we looked at the long time diffusion coefficient of such a particle system, but first we took the simplest possible case we could consider and we also neglect the intrinsic Brownian motion. So it's, sim it's only active motion. So this is the simplest model you can consider for an active glass liquid. And we set out to see if we could first fully understand this behavior and see if we can add complexity from there onward. And so for such a system, we looked at the long time diffusion coefficient and we chose three different combinations at the high number densities and different effective temperatures. And the reason we chose these, these three different points is because we know due to the interaction potential that we chose that in the passive limits so at zero persistence, they give all the same Brownian result. So this allows for a nice comparison. But what was, what was really surprising and interesting to us is that in the non-equilibrium limits, so when we introduce activity, this, this equivalence seems to carry over because these curves look very similar. Um, but they are, of course, shifted. And so what we think is going on is that we can rescale these results uh, in order to have them collapse. So this was the question we asked ourselves. And in fact, it can be shown that if you not use the persistence time as our control parameter, but instead what is known as the persistence length. So this is the, the length typically covered by a single active particle before it changes its direction of motion. These curves all collapse. And so this is really interesting because it shows that there's actually universal behavior, even when we go out of equilibrium 
um, with with the activity being introduced in the system. And so this hopefully can give more insight. But besides giving this nice collapse and showing that these, these results can be collapsed onto, onto each other, we also find that if we rescale the persistence length onto what is known as the cage length. And so the cage length is really this, this typical free volume that each particle has while being caged by its surrounding particles at these, these high densities. So it's a very important parameter in conventional glass theory. And we show that if we rescale this persistence length onto the cage length, this maximum of the dynamics, so where the system is most fluid-like, actually coincides where this is exactly one. So it seems that the glassy dynamics is, is uh, still fastest. So it's most liquid-like when these there's a resonance or a um, when these two length scales are of the same order of magnitude. And so we uh, we then set out, okay, can we then explain uh, why we find this normal atomic behavior also physically? And so for that, we came up with the, the following argument where we show that uh, if this persistence length is much smaller than the cage length, then actually particles move diffusively inside this cage already. So this is not the optimal way of migrating throughout the material and giving uh, more liquid-like behavior. But then when these length scales are roughly of the, same, uh, of the same order of magnitude, then it can lead to a very efficient scanning of the cage because it exactly changes the direction of active motion when it reaches the edge of the cage. And that way it can most effectively find a way out of its cage and move throughout the material. But then if you go well beyond the cage length, we can actually have particles that because it's still at very high densities that they remain stuck on one side of the cage. And it takes a very long time to, to reorient again and find a different opening. And so this overall leads to a decrease of the dynamics again, which is also what we found for the, for the long time diffusion coefficient. So overall, we think this has to do with the most efficient case exploration, which gives a nice and simple interpretation of this, these results and of this active classy behavior. But this is all nice, but um, of course, we've only looked at the simplest possible situation and the simplest possible uh, model system. So can we add some complexity and see if this argument still holds? Well, the easiest thing we could do is simply add Brownian motion back again into our model system. So now particles move not only due to Brownian motion, but also, um, uh, but also via activity. So it's both a combination of Brownian motion and active motion. And so in that case, what we found is actually that we still have the same non-monotonic behavior and we can still rescale a length scale onto the cage length to have the maximum of the dynamics exactly at one. The only thing that seems to change is this length scale. And that makes sense because at short times, uh, we now not only have active motion, but also Brownian motion. So we need to introduce an effective length scale that captures also this Brownian motion on short times. But if we do that, we see that our physical picture remains fully intact and we can understand these results also for, for a thermal system. Uh, so this is nice. It gives a bit of uh, robustness to our, to our arguments, and, um, but can we do better? And so for that, we also looked at a different active matter model. So we've looked initially at active Brownian particles for which the active motion undergoes random rotational diffusion. Uh, but we can also look at a different active matter model, in which case the active velocity is uh, undergoing a, a ornstein uhlenbeck process and is Gaussian distributed. But if we change to this different model system, we actually find quantitatively the same results. So it seems that also for a different active matter model, this argument still holds, and we find a good agreement between both model systems. So this also gives some added weight. And the final thing we checked is, okay, what if we make our particles softer? Because initially we've looked at um, more hard sphere-like particles, but of course cells are much softer, uh, softer particles. So what if we make our spherical particles at least already softer? And so in that case, we still find the qualitative behavior that it remains fully intact. It only becomes slightly less uh, dramatic but we've, in a follow-up work, we've been able to fully rationalize these results. And we've shown that these are completely um, in line with, with uh, our initial arguments. So it seems to also hold for softer particles.
And so we have some nice argument for, for these simple model systems of active glassy liquids. Um, but then coming back to the original motivation uh, of looking at these kinds of systems, which, was, which were these conflicting results in literature. And we found actually that this insight can actually reconcile all these different departures in literature. So what we found is that in most studies that they've previously done, they've looked mainly at this persistence time as their control parameter. But we've shown that if you rescale this onto a persistence length and then compare with the cage length, we can actually show that they were only looking at one side of this non-monotonic behavior. And actually, um, if they were to 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 do the full parameter range, then it would also get non-monotonic behavior. So it also is able to reconcile these different departures in literature, which is also nice and uh, gives a nice overall picture of at least these, these simple model systems to help further rationalize active glassy dynamics. And so with that, I would like to uh, conclude by saying that the cage length uh, seems to dictate when these active Brownian particle systems migrate most effectively in these very high density conditions when there's caging going on. And on top of that, we've shown that this physical mechanism is highly robust when we introduce both Brownian motion, a different active matter model, and a uh, different particle softness. But of course, spherical systems are not cells. Uh, so as a follow-up, we would like to extend these modeling efforts to also include deformable cell shapes, or maybe even add a nucleus, because it's known that a nucleus is much stiffer than, than the cytoplasm. So maybe can we do a two particle system uh, where we can take both these effects into account? And in parallel, because this has mostly been about simulations, uh, we've looked at uh, looked also into theoretical tools to understand this relation between structure and dynamics in active glassy matter. And so this has been initialized by this study in 2017, where they found a phase diagram, depending on, for instance, the active speed and the persistence. And we've recently also done some follow-up work uh, in this direction to also build a theoretical framework based on uh, uh, on the tools known from statistical physics to better understand also active classic matter. And so with that, I would like to thank my supervisor, Elisabeth Janssen, and my colleagues at the Soft Matter and Biological Physics Group at the TUE in Eindhoven, and of course you for your attention. Thank you. <laughs>